Thank you to the uh, School of Public Health, the White House, Judy, Elizabeth, Dean Clagg, for your uh, invitation for me to be here. I've really been anticipating this, uh, an opportunity to learn a lot about child sex trafficking. You know, I have a four-year-old daughter, Maya, and, and she's been saying to me recently when she's anticipating something, um, Daddy, is today tomorrow? And so <laughs> that's sort of the way I feel. Tomorrow is finally here. We just had a, uh, a seminar at CDC yesterday, in fact, on uh, sex trafficking, and we had some wonderful speakers. In fact, Sharon Cooper here, who's in the audience, spoke at that, and it was really, uh, really informative and important for our staff to hear directly from people who work in this area, um, both nationally as well as within the Atlanta area. So we're learning a lot more about it. Um, you know, I want to begin by having you imagine something. I want you to imagine that you picked up the paper this morning or looked at the news on the internet, and there was a, a story about scientists discovering a new disease. And you went on to read the story, and the story said that scientists had discovered that about a billion children each year throughout the world were exposed to this disease. And that of those children exposed, they were at greater risk for mental health problems, such as depression, anxiety, PTSD, greater risk for chronic diseases, such as diabetes, cancer, heart disease sometime during their life, greater risk for HIV and some other infectious diseases, even greater risk for involvement in social problems like crime. What would we do? Well, the truth is that there is such a disease. It's called violence against children and the exploitation of children. And child sexual trafficking is an important part of that global problem. And that's what I'm gonna focus on today, is really telling you why we think that child sexual trafficking has important health implications, implications for public health. Well, in reviewing the literature, the existing literature on child sex trafficking, you can't help but be struck by a few things. One is that many, I don't think we have a precise fix on what percentage, but perhaps most of children that are, are trafficked come from, come from very difficult family backgrounds. These backgrounds that consist of harsh, inconsistent parenting, physical, sexual, emotional abuse, um, problems that parents have with alcohol and drug abuse, incarceration, witnessing abuse in the home and their communities. And these exposures often are what place children at greater vulnerability to actually being trafficked, either because they run away or are driven to the street or because, because of these exposures, they're more vulnerable for other reasons, more vulnerable to being groomed, for example. And then we also know obviously and very clearly that children involved in, in sex trafficking experience incredible adversity and stress. They witness physical and sexual violence. They are victims of physical and sexual violence repeatedly. They're isolated from any source of support, usually. And they are often engaged in drug and alcohol abuse. So what is the consequence of these exposures to children? What is the outcome of this? What can we expect in terms of the health implications of these types of exposures? Well, one place we want to start to talk about this is I think it's important to understand some of the basic principles we've been learning about child development. Um, one of the sources for the next few slides I'm going to show you is the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child. It has a wonderful we website if you want to learn more about this. Or if you've ever heard Jack Shonkoff speak, he's a wonderful spokesperson for these issues and the science of child development. One thing is clear is that the brain is central to healthy child development. You know, in public health, we focus very often or, or on hearts as an important organ, as, lung, as lungs, uh, livers, um, other organs. But I don't think we focus enough yet or haven't focused enough yet on the importance and centrality of the brain 
to healthy child development. One of the things we're learning about the brain development and child development is that it involves an interaction between the influences of our life experiences, our environment, and our, our genetic endowment. You know, when I was in school, what we, we often heard people say, well, this problem is 60% caused by genetics and 40% caused by environment or 70% caused by genetics. That sort of thinking is no longer accepted by scientists, particularly in the area of child development. We understand now that our child development is an interaction between our biology and the environments in which we exist. So the environment is very critical, influences our biology, and in turn, biology influences the environment. And you'll see how very soon. It's also important to note that brain development is critical at early ages of life, but doesn't stop developing there. The brain is, some parts of the brains remain plastic and vulnerable to the environment through early adulthood, and perhaps even um, further on in life. Um, particularly the frontal cortex, the part that regulates emotions, remains vulnerable to, the, to stresses and adversity uh, through early adulthood. Another really important thing we've learned from the science of child development is that relationships are the active ingredients of this environmental influence. Nurturing and responsive and individualized interactions build healthy brains. And this sets the foundation for all future learning, behavior, and health. And we also know that excessive and repeated stress causes the brain to release chemicals that disrupt brain architecture, that impair cell growth, the formation of healthy neural circuitry, can actually impair um, certain systems in the brain, like the stress regulation system that are critical in, in many ways. There are different types of stress, right? I mean, stress isn't all bad. Um, the stress of a child taking a, preparing and, and taking a test, for example, is a type of positive stress that's important from their, for them to learn about and to experience and grow from. Then there's also really, you know, difficult stressful issues like losing a sibling or losing a parent. That can be very stressful, but in the context of supportive relationships, in the context of healthy, safe, nurturing environments, children can tolerate these stresses very well. The, con the concern we have is with toxic stress, and that is strong and prolonged psychological responses in the absence of supportive relationships. And if you think about it, this is exactly what the victims of child sex trafficking are experiencing. I want to show you some, some data from a study that's called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. This was a study that was conducted uh, in a collaboration between CDC and Kaiser Permanent, Permanente in San Diego. It was done during the mid-1990s, and data is still being analyzed, and participants are being followed. It has about 17,000 participants. And what they did was basically they asked the adults in this um, HMO about their adverse experiences as children. And you can see the list of these adverse experiences. They're the same things that I put up in that slide that victims of child sex trafficking are exposed to, both in their family background often and also in the context of the experience of being trafficked. And what they did was they took these measures of adversity, which include maltreatment and witnessing violence and parents that are involved in incarceration and have mental health issues, and they create an ACE score. And the ACE score is a, is a measure of the number of different types of these adversities they're exposed to. So if you are exposed to physical abuse and witnessing your mother being beaten, those, that gets you a score of 10, of two, I mean. And if you're exposed to uh, a parent having a mental health problem and substance abuse and emotional maltreatment, you get a score of three and so on. They then associated this with the health issues that the participants in this HMO were experiencing. Here is an example of the relationship between the ACE score and mental health, particularly adult depression. 
And what you see is a graded relationship between the odds of experiencing depression and the number of ACEs, the number of adverse childhood experiences. Those respondents with five or more ACEs were at five times greater risk of suffering from depression than those that experienced no ACEs. Okay, it's not just mental health though. Also, physical health is affected. Here are the odds of, of experiencing cardiovascular disease with the increase in the number of ACEs. And you can see, again, this graded relationship with those experiencing the most adverse experiences having up to three times greater risk of experiencing cardiovascular disease as those who experience none. This same type of trend that you see here for cardiovascular disease is also evident for diabetes, hypertension, stroke, obesity, and cancer. No, it, it doesn't end there, unfortunately. Even risks for infectious diseases like HIV are affected by child adversity. Here we can see a consistent relationship between the number of ACEs and IV drug use, sexual promiscuity, and the, the risk of having a sexually transmitted disease. The literature linking various types of exposure to adversity in childhood to health problems is enormous. It's literally hundreds and hundreds of studies. Every week I see a new study come out establishing and supporting this relationship. Um, and you can see from this chart that there's many outcomes beyond the ones that I just shared you data with that we find relationships. The evidence is stronger for the links between childhood adversity and some of these health outcomes than others, but it's remarkable the consistency of the, of the research find a link between the exposure to the types of adversity and a broad range of health and social problems. This pyramid sort of describes the sort of sequence of events that you sort of, that we, that we see, a relationship between adverse exposures to social, emotional, cognitive impairments, the adoption of health risk behaviors, disease, and then premature death. In the same study that I mentioned in San Diego, they did, they did one study where they looked at um, mortality in this population. They found that those participants who had seven or eight um, ACEs experienced a life expectancy 20 years shorter than those that had no adverse childhood experiences. So what is it that's happening in the brain? How do we explain this? How do we explain this remarkable consistency across a variety of health outcomes? Well, as I said earlier, violence, exploitation, child sex trafficking leads to obviously toxic stress for the individuals involved in these, for the children that are exposed to these uh, situations. That damages brain architecture. One way, for example, it can damage brain architecture is up by affecting the stress regulation system. And what some um, children may be doing in response to that, to adapting to and dealing with the changes in their brain is self-medicating. They may self-medicate by smoking, by overeating, by using drugs. Risk behaviors for a variety of health outcomes down the road. But there's also other possible ways that, that, that scientists are discovering that could have an impact. It actually gets under the skin in very fundamental ways and affects the DNA of children. There's research now linking exposure to this type of stress to uh, damaging to chromosomes, particularly the telomeres, the caps on chromosomes um, in children and even women exposed to abuse are shorter in those exposed to abuse and shorter telomeres are associated with disease. There's one study I saw recently that estimated that children exposed to abuse are likely to suffer the degenerative diseases of adulthood 10 years sooner than their peers who don't suffer such abuse. So I had that box with the question mark about what are children who are child sex trafficked children likely to, to 
What are the consequences that they are likely to experience as a result of these exposures? These are the consequences. They're likely to have mental and physical health problems. These health problems are likely to be at, at elevated risk through the rest of their life without appropriate intervention. They're also likely to suffer cognitive impairments. It's a very serious health and public health problem. So what are some of the implications of this? Well, I think one obvious one that you can see, and we all have noted in different ways already, is that sex trafficking is linked to a host of other social problems. I think this has enormous implications. One is how can we build on the infrastructure um, that are already established to, develop, to address these other problems to help in addressing child sex trafficking? Um, how can we build on or use what we've learned about preventing child maltreatment to help prevent or address the issues that lead to child sex trafficking to address this problem? How can we build on the healthcare system in terms of their knowledge and dealing with the consequences of problems like child sex trafficking in addressing this issue. I think it has important implications for responding to child sex trafficking. One, I think services need to be attuned, of course, to many of the physical problems that these children are likely to address, but also in particularly mental health and risk-taking behaviors. We know how to treat many of the mental health consequences of child sex trafficking. I think the difficulties arise in how we get children who experience this to, to into treatment and to adhere to treatment. Um, I think obviously we need to get survivors of child sex trafficking into safe, stable, nurturing environments. I don't underestimate the difficulty of doing these things, but I think as a basic principle, we have to put these children back in environments where they are protected from the kinds of adversities that they've experienced. And oftentimes, I believe, these children re-experience adversities in other settings. And I think importantly, there's a need for a coordinated local and national response. Because of the linkages of this problem to other outcomes, that's essential that that happen. But also the nature of trafficking moves children around geographically. There needs to be coordination between what we're doing locally and what we're doing at the state and federal level. Okay, another aspect of the brain science that's very important is that what we are learning is that because brain circuits stabilize over time, that the cost of altering these circuits increases as the brain matures. This means that it's much better to try to fix the problem at the beginning than try to fix it later. It's much less costlier to try to address ch child tra sa sex trafficking by preventing it than dealing with the consequences. The potential benefits of effective prevention may be really substantial. We did a study of the cost of child maltreatment in the United States a couple years ago. We estimated that the cases of child maltreatment that were confirmed in child welfare agencies in 2008, only the new cases coming to the attention in that year had a social cost of $124 billion over the course of the lifetime of those children exposed, just in that year. So each year, another 124 or so billion dollars. Now that was based on just cases confirmed in child welfare agencies. I would imagine that most children that are sex trafficked are not identified as being victims of child maltreatment in, in, the, in the child welfare um, system. Uh, but if you, if you expand our estimate of how much child maltreatment occurs, beyond the child, ch those confirmed deaths in child welfare, you get to an estimate of maybe $500 billion a year in the cost for just one year of new cases of child maltreatment. But I wanted to show you this because I think the economic benefits of preventing maltreatment and child sex trafficking could be enormous. When we looked at the an just one facet, the annual earnings from child maltreatment, reductions in annual earnings from child maltreatment that victims are likely to suffer, it was almost $6,000 a year. And when we compared that to similar estimates 
for obesity, teen pregnancy, and smoking, we found that that estimate was more than all of those three combined. So these are problems that we focus a lot of attention on. Obesity, pregnancy, smoking, very important problems. But let's not underestimate the costs of things like child sex trafficking. Let me wrap up by talking about some possible avenues for primary prevention. These are very general, but I think we have to reduce the supply of children vulnerable to, tracking, to trafficking and creating safe, stable, nurturing environments for vulnerable children is key. We know something about preventing child maltreatment and we can apply that to the populations of children vulnerable to child sex trafficking because they're experiencing abuse. Increasing the resilience of children by improving awareness, not just their awareness, but the awareness of their parents, um, increasing their life skills, enhancing opportunities, and as has been mentioned, reducing the demand for child prostitution by increasing the costs, both social and economic, of soliciting sex, changing social norms that promote sexual exploitation. And we don't talk about human rights much in this country, but I think that this is a gross violation of the human rights of children. And is that an avenue where we can promote um, the prevention of the exploitation of children? There's a need for better research. I'm not going to dwell on this because I have to wrap up my time right here. Let me move to the final slide. But we need better estimates. We need better research for a variety of reasons. Better estimates of the magnitude of the problem. One key reason is because we want to be able to measure whether we're making a difference. If we don't know the basic magnitude and nature of the problem, then we're not going to be able to tell the White House and other key stakeholders whether we're making a difference in solving this problem. That is key, basic, critical. In terms of evaluation, we need to do more of it. We need to do a better job. But we can't wait till we have perfect answers. We need to learn as we go. Finally, um, child sex trafficking is what policymakers often call a wicked problem. It's one that's resistant to resolution for a variety of reasons. It's a problem, therefore, that demands creative solutions. We have to think outside the box. As I just said, investing in research is critical. It's fundamental. We all have a stake in this. We need to break down the silos. We can't view this issue as just a criminal justice, just a public health, just a social welfare issue. We need to lick it together. And finally, the greatest enemy is fatalism. That's the belief that we can't change our future. And this is a problem where I suspect that many people would question whether we can change it. There's two antidotes to fatalism. One is to demonstrate that we can make a difference by investing in the research to show that we can actually reduce child sex trafficking. And the other is through inspiration and to be inspired to address this problem by the children we are serving. And the faces of these beautiful children on this slide, I think, inspire that hope. So thank you very much.